The following show is brought to you in partnership with the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History, Blue Star Strategies, Bright Road Incorporated, Make It Plain Podcast, and RPC Media. campus of the University of the District of Columbia. This is State of Play. Welcome to State of Play. I'm Sharon Pratt. And with me, I have Karen Tramontano and the Reverend Mark Thompson. Our topic today, the technology gap, especially for communities of color, whether it's jobs, businesses, or the adverse impact in getting credit or uh, in the criminal justice system. Fortunately for us, we have a leading expert, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. She is the director of the Center for Technology Innovation with the Brookings Institution. Before that, she was with the Multimedia Telecom Internet Council, and even before that, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. What an honor to have you with us. Oh, thanks for having me, Mayor. I just so appreciate being here today. I talked about, I highlighted the areas where it has an inverse impact on people of color. Which of these concern you the most? Oh my goodness, I think they all do. I mean, when we think about (laughs) the depth of technology, it's almost as if technology is sort of uh, trailing alongside systemic inequalities. At all of these stops, we're actually seeing people of color, particularly people of color who are low income, live in rural areas, you know, maybe older, affected by these technologies in ways that technology was never designed to be, right? It was always supposed to be a game changer to solve social problems. So I would say all of them have become equally important. So do you think the federal government understands the depth of the problem? Well, you know, I think it's interesting, that question, because I think the federal government has a role to play on a couple of fronts and allow me to sort of break it down. First and foremost, we need the federal government to understand that they have to invest in us. And what that means is a lot of times that we see these intersectionalities between racism and discrimination in tech, it's because nobody like us is sitting at the table at the beginning when we're developing these ideas. And it's important that we have workforce diversity, particularly in companies that have less than two to three percent of representation in head decision makers, uh, engineers, as well as data scientists. So let's start there. There are ways that Congress can start pumping that money back into computer science uh, careers for young people or figuring out ways to create more inclusive data sets for the scientists that are building these products. But then I say the second thing is we need to distinguish what Congress is looking at, which is the digital divide from these other things, Mayor, that you talked about. The digital divide is about who is online, who is not, who has a device, who does it. Last year, when 50 million school-age kids were sent home from school, We found out that 15 to 16 million of them did not either have a device or broadband. Nine million didn't have either. And the majority of those were kids who were of color, black, brown, and those from tribal lands. We're now suffering this from this because those young people are now one, two, three, 10 months to almost a year behind when it comes to schooling because they lack the materials necessary to actually engage in distance learning. Sounds to me like a Brown versus Board of Education situation, but I will come back to that in my writing. When we start to piece the digital divide, that obviously requires the government to look at adoption, infrastructure, as well as a range of other of ways that we have to get people involved. And then the final thing I'll just say there, on the criminal justice side, it's really important that we begin to look at the decisions that these computerized systems are making. Did you know, not too long before the insurrection on January 6th, that a black man in Detroit was misidentified by facial recognition technology, sat in the station for six hours, only to be found out that he didn't even do a crime. We need to get better at these things because the very technology that was supposed to solve problems should not be creating new ones. We've already marched. We've already fought for civil rights. And so we need to make sure the technology catches up with where we are in terms of our freedoms. So the pandemic is clearly, you know, taking the covers off of these systemic issues. How do we keep the pressure on 
so that it's not forgotten a month from now, two months from now. You know, Karen, that is such a great question. I, and I'll go back to my example of the schools. Here we have now the ability to bring our kids back to school in the fall. But I actually would say to any educator listening that we cannot abandon what we did to get kids connected. We should be having, much like we did with No Child Left Behind, an initiative of No Child Left Offline. The, the fact that we had young people who didn't have a tablet next to their textbook, a Wi-Fi hotspot with a pencil, or any type of provision or guidance on how to get online is something we need to work with. And we should not allow these lessons of 12 months during this pandemic to actually push those kids back into an, a, a vacuum where they cannot have the same 21st century tools to be productive. So I'm saying out there, there's a lot of stimulus money that actually went to good programming. We need to make those more permanent, much like the emergency broadband benefit for affordable broadband and the monies that went to schools to be able to provide for these hotspots and tablets. And also isn't having or not having broadband going to impact some workers' ability to get a job and keep a job? Oh my goodness, Reverend, you are so right on that. I think this is where it becomes important as this administration thinks about the infrastructure money, let's start thinking how FDR thought about the, the New Deal. What's our tech New Deal? That it moves it away from just passive consumption to production. Where are we actually putting people to work in these jobs that are now going to be taking over our communities? There were thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses owned by people of color women that were lost. They're not coming back to our communities. But yet it takes an idea through a startup, a black startup. It takes the ability to train people on how to string wire or fiber optics cable. Those are livable wage scale jobs. And so we need to be pushing towards a tech new deal that combines not just closing the digital divide, but making sure we get people back to work, particularly people of color. Well, the impasse that we're having on the Hill now around the infrastructure initiative pushed by Biden seems to be a pushback by Republicans for any investment in retrofitting in human beings to participate in the new economy as against physical infrastructure. Do, is it about the dollars or is it about where you spend your money? So when I was growing up, my mom used to say it's the dollars and it's the cents. Let me tell you something. You can't <laughs> ride on a new road without a car. The same way that you cannot be a student K through 12 without a tablet or a hotspot. That soft infrastructure, I call it, is local infrastructure. You know, can I tell you all one thing? 10 seconds. We should have every federally assisted housing development in the United States, particularly in Washington, D.C., with broadband already built into it. We have to start looking at ways to have a connected mindset if we're going to make sure that our connected communities are economically uh, prospering in the new economy. We're very fortunate to have you here. We're very fortunate in our country to have you. Thank you for being on State of Play. Thank you. Welcome back to State of Play. We're today talking about the digital divide, that huge chasm where the digital world is growing and it appears our numbers in terms of participation may be shrinking. It is a very daunting circumstance that people of color are not at the table in any way and people of color are being negatively impacted in profound ways. And it's very, very alarming. What this brings up for me is once again, how far behind black and brown people are in so many places. So we look at what's happening in neighborhoods with gentrification, we're being priced out of neighborhoods that we're being locked out of cyberspace, really. And the more you hear about it, that there are certain jobs, especially post-pandemic, that are going to depend on employees being connected to broadband, being online, then we have a real challenge. And so if you look at it, so many Black and Brown workers are behind in terms of access to jobs. And then you add on top of that, the booming broadband working economy. It's something that really has to be taken more seriously. You know, the thing that concerns me the most, and perhaps it's because I didn't understand the depth of the problem, is the design bias. Now, you know, I know the pipeline is very thin for black and brown people in uh, technology. 
And I understand, and certainly the pandemic has made us all aware of the access issues. But the design bias in data, data that we believe is neutral, is not. It is far from neutral. It has decades and decades and decades of systemic bias built in. And it is this data that policymakers are using to make decisions to do what? But to correct, you know, the historical technology gap. Well, it can't happen if we're building decisions on this data. Now, we've talked about how it impacts employment and business opportunities, but our next guest is going to explain to us how it impacts every decision, every aspect of our lives. You know, one of the, the, the visceral experience that I, experiences that I had on a regular basis was um, the, the rolling of helicopters over my L.A. house that kind of shook the walls, shook the roof. Um, going to school and seeing, you know, uh, kids from my school lined up against the fence and being pat down, talking about elementary school. And so this abundance of policing in my neighborhood um, really gave me a critical disposition to this institution. And so what motivated me to write Race After Technology and to think about the new Jim Code is the way that policing can happen in other guises, in other forms. It's not just people. I couldn't have a civil rights career without broadcasting, and I couldn't be a broadcaster without intersecting civil rights. We are living in an era of the greatest disinformation we've ever seen. I think State of Play is gonna play an important role in diffusing the chatter from what's actually pertinent for people to know for their well-being. Welcome back to State of Play. Now we're gonna talk about how this digital world we live in has the negative implications on so many aspects of our lives, especially for people of color. We have the perfect expert, Dr. Ruha Benjamin. She's a professor in the African-American Studies Department at Princeton University. She's the founder of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab and the author of uh, Race After Technology. I would sort of transpose it up there. Uh, thank you so very much for being here. Such an honor. Thank you for having me. So you talk about this gym code, so to speak, of uh, this, how this technology is often used in a way or how it's organized in a way that has negative implications for people of color. Can you sort of elaborate on what gym code means? Absolutely. G the new gym code is a combination of coded inequity and imagined objectivity. The fact that we imagine technology to be more objective and neutral than the human counterpart. So if we acknowledge that there's racism and discrimination in our courts or in our hospitals or in our schools, a lot of people assume that taking those decisions that human beings would normally make and allowing technology to make them will get us around the bias, will kind of fix the problem without recognizing that technology is created by human beings, the assumptions, the values, the desires, the interests that, that shape our society becomes baked in and encoded into these technical systems. And the real danger is that unlike their human counterparts where you can point to a racist judge or, or, or doctor or teacher, when it's within a technical system, we assume that it's neutral. So it's harder to hold accountable. And so what the new Jim Code does is name this problem so that we can start to shine a light on it and deal with it and try to address it in, in really productive ways. So, so, so could you take us through examples? So let's say you're trying to get be paroled or you're trying to get a loan or trying to get a job. Could you show us how, how all that of applies? These, yes, all of these um, automated decision systems have to be taught how to make decisions. They don't just grow on trees. And so the question is, is how do we teach them? We teach them by feeding past data, past human decisions, whether it's who got, got who got, gets loans, who gets paroled, um, you know, who gets the job. So we take that historic data and we train these systems how to make future predictions and decisions. So if in a certain industry, 
um, black folks have been discriminated for generations or in a certain neighborhoods uh, have been uh, uh, you know, profiled for generations, that data becomes a starting point that we use to teach these systems how to make future decisions. And then we assume that it's neutral because it's being spit out by a software system, but we have to question the source of that data and the source of the human decisions and the assumption of neutrality when it comes to the, these, um, these software systems in so many areas of our lives. Is there an aspect of life where it's more alarming? I think we have to be concerned about it everywhere. So I, I do think when it comes to, let's say, do-gooding professions like healthcare, people assume because it has this ethos of wanting to heal and help that we can put our guard down and assume that actually, you know, just because people are well-meaning that the outcomes will be good. And I think we do have to stay on high alert even in those arenas. What's so interesting to think about is that when an AI system in the context of healthcare is trained using data from doctor's reports, let's say doctor's reports of pain, we know that doctors and healthcare professionals um, routinely underestimate the pain of Black patients. That's in their reports. And so if you train an AI based on that, the AI system is going to continue that process of underestimating the pain of Black patients. But recently, there was a study that trained AI based on patients' self-reported pain. And it was much more accurate because it was actually going to the source of the pain and was not being filtered through the, the discriminatory lens of the experts, let's say, in that industry. So there are ways to think critically and create these, um, these systems um, with equity and justice in mind. So you want to lead or to some extent inspire others to lead an abolitionist movement against this new Jim Code. Can you give us some of the tools to do that? So first and first and foremost, we need a name. We need a way to name what's happening to us. Because if we can't name it, we can't talk about it, we can't organize against it. And that's why I've developed this idea of the new Jim Code to remind us that history is in our present. It's being uh, put into all these shiny new features, shiny new systems, but historic data is actually driving the, these emerging technologies. And so to organize, we have community organizations that are working on this, organizations like data for black lives and different in different cities there's different regional and city based organizations that i call tech justice organizations there's legislation that's being drafted around algorithmic accountability because this can't just be a kind of patchwork thing where you leave it to different states and cities to deal with we re we need a national even international way of thinking about accountability when it comes to technology and of course my home turf is education we have to reimagine re how we're training future technologists so that rather than just being reactive to harmful technologies, we can have people at the source that are building them with these values in mind. And so the pedagogy from K through 12 and higher education in computer science and engineering and STEM across the board has to be infused with an equity lens and an equity approach. Where do you think you can have the greater impact? Is it education? Is it regulation? We need to be working on multiple fronts. Education is where we seed what we wanna see 50 years from now, we start seeding that in education. But the algorithmic harms are already happening now. People are being misidentified by facial recognition. People are being excluded for opportunities based on um, targeted advertisements and automated systems. So legislation and also legal mechanisms to actually uh, hold these harms accountable, they have to happen yesterday. And so we need people working on multiple fronts rather than, than saying one goes before the other. But in order to get where you think we need to go, and I agree with you, we've got to sort of purge all of our data banks, do we not? You know, I think it's really hard to simply think what we might do as individuals, because, you know, it, the, the common parlance is that we're users, right? We're users of technology. But if you're a user, you're going to get used. So another way to think about technology and technology access is the technology that we have access to has access to us. And as you, you're noting, the data that we are producing is actually the lifeblood of these technological systems. So something that we can all do right away is to actually um, become, start to think of ourselves more as stewards of technology. 
as people who don't just have an obligation to protect our personal privacy, but have to think about what are the legal, what are the policy frameworks, what's the ecosystem in which technology is being developed and push for that ecosystem to reflect public values rather than private interests. And so this, to do this though, we all have to feel like we have a stake. Um, we can't just leave this to the people with the fancy degrees, the people with the technological know-how, because often they don't have the social and historical know-how. And so Black communities, Black scholars, um, Black engineers, Black students, we all have to rise up and understand that we have a stake in this and we have to shape the future that we want to see exist. Well, I, I think obviously you are getting the attention of a great many people uh, and you're winning a lot of praise, which is uh, very encouraging. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's still a daunting task to get people exercised around something where few of us know a lot about it. Um, and so I guess maybe you tune into and work with other activist groups like, you know, Black Lives Matter and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. If you go to the resources page of my personal website, there's a whole host of ways to plug in. We don't have to just sit at home and feel paranoid about surveillance or paranoid <laughs> about, you know, Big Brother looking over our shoulder. We can actually plug in to community groups, to organizations, and there's a whole host of them around the country to actually begin to empower us um, to change that paranoia into power. And so I would encourage those who are listening who feel concerned to realize that now is the time to get involved. Now is the time to shine a light on systems that would rather stay in the dark. So many of these systems would rather hide behind the cloak of neutrality and make all kinds of decisions about our lives without us having a say. And now is the time for us to speak up. Well, good for you. You're doing great work and we need you desperately. So thank you for being on State of Play. Welcome back to State of Play. We're today talking about the digital divide, that huge chasm where the digital world is growing and it appears our numbers in terms of participation may be shrinking. Uh, but we now have an expert, someone who's managed to bridge that digital divide and actually has strategies for increasing the numbers in the pipeline. We have Dr. Nashley Cephas, who is an applied scientist with Amazon Web Services, and she's on their machine learning team. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, your path, your journey to becoming where you are today, your mother, I gather, encouraged you. You had teachers who encouraged you because it's so rare to have women, much less an African-American woman, in the kind of position you're in today. Yes, yes. So I was I was encouraged. Uh, I grew up in a house full of women, uh, very strong matriarchy. And I, I believe that that was what instilled in me that as a woman, you could be and do whatever it is that you want to do. We worked a lot on uh, projects at home, DIY projects, um, everything from hanging ceiling fans to putting down floors and mowing the yard. And so we learned how everything worked and were encouraged to do so. Uh, it really wasn't until I got into the world and realized um, some of the challenges it was uh, to be a woman in this field, especially a black woman from the South. And so I was very, uh, you know, uh, challenged at first, but I found the help that I needed through mentors. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend several uh, summer camps as a child, um, middle school and high school on computer engineering and other types of engineering at nearby university, Jackson State University, as well as Mississippi State University, where I ended up getting my undergrad. Uh, and I, I thought that was extremely helpful as well to at least be exposed to that technology, which is something that I hope to do uh, for my community and continue to do for my community as well. Your mother got you started by giving you a computer when you're around eight or nine? Yes. So uh, my mother bought a computer for my sister and I believe it was called a Packard Bell computer. Um, and it had speakers on the side and, and we used to have to um, this was the age of dial up, um, very slow internet. And so we had to get off the, the computer anytime we were downloading music when, when my grandmother wanted to use the phone. And so, uh, it, but it was very fascinating in how you could code, you can 
you uh, play games, you can pretty much do your homework, you can listen to music. I mean, I've just really learned and, de- and wanted to delve into it even more. Dr. Cephas, tell us a bit more about your professional career. That's also exceptional. I know you're with Amazon, you're working with artificial intelligence and facial recognition. Also tell us, if you would, how the algorithms for artificial intelligence are not so intelligent when it comes to discerning the facial recognition of those with features like yours and mine. Right, so we have uh, a team at Amazon uh, that I work on, uh, focused on fairness and mitigating biases in AI technologies. And it's, it's quite a, a unique, uh, you know, and, and taboo concept uh, because as my uh, math teacher used to tell me, whenever you use a calculator, you know, garbage in to the calculator, garbage out. It doesn't guarantee the right answer. You can think about uh, these machine learning tools and these AI tools as the same type of concept. Uh, we feed it data. We feed this, uh, these algorithms and these, this computer programming uh, data that has happened in the past it learns from that data and it creates models to predict things in the future. The same way we do with um, predicting weather forecasts um, and learning from past history and humidity, temperature, based on your location, et cetera. Um, Except for now with um, machine learning applied in terms of artificial intelligence, uh, we're now able to predict, uh, you know, what a person said or uh, have a conversation. A computer can have a conversation with someone or uh, we can, you know, like you say, predict different things and different attributes about a person's face. Uh, Now, the nuance comes in when the data that this algorithm was trained on is not balanced or it may not be representative of all of the people that are using the data. And so that is when you come into issues where when you're testing, uh, you'll have some discrepancies or disparities in the results across different ethnicities. You may have disparities across different races, uh, gender, age, et cetera. And so it really depends on what that algorithm was trained on, how you're testing it. Um, and, and quite frankly, for me, it all goes back to who's at the table when you're designing your products. Um, are we creating fair pipelines and equity and access to everyone uh, that works on this technology to come and have a seat at the table, whether that means hiring them, which I hope it does, or you can get that same input through focus groups. Um, and that's something that we as a large company um, that I work at at Amazon, as well as across the tech industry, have to take a hard look at, um, including working with other entities like government uh, policy holders and things like that. So Dr. Cephas, um, was this your inspiration, this lack of diversity, lack of Uh, people of color and other voices around the table. Is this your inspiration for the Bean Path? Yes, absolutely. I started the Bean Path uh, nonprofit back in 2018 in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, It's a majority uh, Black city. Mississippi as a whole is is known to be under the poverty line. Um, And so I wanted to be a part of the solution and not the problem. Uh, And I just quite frankly got tired of Every time I would go, uh, I spent a lot of time in in, uh, the West Coast, in New York City, even in Atlanta. And when I would go back home, um, topics like Internet uh, of Things or AI or cybersecurity or cryptocurrency were just uh, majority foreign concepts in the places where I grew up. And I wanted to make sure that I changed that and provided some exposure and some light to those people, young and old, so that they can be a part of this conversation. Well, you're an inspiration to us all. I mean, uh, we we really appreciate your leadership on this and your journey alone is an inspiration to everyone. So uh, we're very, we're going to get behind you in any way we can. We want you back on State of Play anytime you can. Uh, And we were honored and enriched by your conversation here on State of Play. Thank you so very much for participating. Thank you all for having me.
Welcome back to State of Play. Our topic today, the digital divide and how that divide, that chasm is daunting. How the digital world is expanding while the numbers of people of color seem to be shrinking. But we have with us now an expert, someone who's trying to address this very issue, Dr. Allison Scott. She is the CEO of Kapor Foundation. Thank you so very much for being here. Thank you, Mayor Pratt. Pleasure to be here with you. So you're a graduate of Hampton University. Uh, you have a PhD in education from the University of California at Berkeley. You've always had a focus seemingly on people of color in this space of STEM, the world of STEM. Uh, why is that? What prompted you to uh, focus on that space? Yeah, so my background in social science research um, has really led me to want to focus on understanding um, and examining systems of inequality and specifically in STEM education and computer science education um, and the tech system, tech ecosystem more broadly. Um, and as, as we've seen over the past decade, um, there's been such an increased uh, uh, focus on technology and it's played an increasing role in our society. And so just so important to understand how um, people of color are being excluded and then what potential solutions are to those challenges. Well, you say people of color are excluded. I think we all kind of grasp that. But what are the numbers? How, you know, what is the percentage of blacks, let's say, uh, in the tech space, the percentage of blacks who are executives in the tech space and the like? Yeah, so we know the tech sector is increasingly driving our economy. So we're talking large numbers, 12 million people um, and almost 2 million uh, new jobs just in the last decade. But only 8% of the tech workforce is black um, and less than 1% are black women. And we've seen over the past five years um, across the large tech Silicon Valley uh, tech companies, very, very minimal progress in representation. Uh, we actually did a study, found only a one percentage point increase despite all of the efforts over the past five years in the representation of black folks in the tech workforce. So what about venture capital? To what extent is that available? And I'm so glad you asked that question because it's such a critical space if, as we think about innovation and creation of new jobs. Um, so in 2019, there was um, 137 billion invested in tech startups and just 1% of those were founded by black entrepreneurs. So there's still a significant amount uh, of work that's needed in the space of venture capital and investment. We need more capital flowing into entrepreneurs. We need to develop um, and support uh, entrepreneurs as they create new innovations in the technology space um, and, and provide them the opportunity and the room to flourish and grow. Well, you know, in the report that I think I saw that you, your foundation did, it suggested that a, 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 venture capital, a venture capitalist provided a black entrepreneur with $125,000 on average uh, as, as the investment, but before white entrepreneurs like $2.5 million, always undercapitalized. I mean, how do you turn that around? Yeah, and that was a critical report done by, uh, we, we cited uh, data from Digital Undivided. Um, they've been looking at this data for the past three or four years. So what we're seeing is really very, very incremental, if any, progress in the amount of capital that's flowing in. I think in the last six months, we saw um, pretty significant commitments from tech and from uh, larger private equity firms towards uh, Black entrepreneurship. Um, but those have really just been a drop in the bucket, a great place to start, but we need much more capital flowing in. Well, you know, what also fascinated me is how your foundation put such a focus on voter education, voter registration. One would not think that that was necessarily a strategy for a foundation focused on addressing uh, presence in the STEM space. Why? So we are a racial justice focused organization. We focus at the intersection of uh, racial justice, obviously in technology. And we saw what was happening over the last uh, year or so and said, it is going to be critical for us to empower communities of color um, to have the opportunity to turn out to vote. Um, and some of the solutions to some of these really complex challenges, both in education, in the workforce, in, in tech, all require both public and private solutions. And so, um, who we elect, um, who our public officials are, can also um, contribute to some of these changes. So we saw a direct connection between the two, and uh, we provided resources to grassroots organizations that have been leading the charge um, for quite some time to turn out voters. So is there a particular piece of legislation, federal or statewide, let's say in California, you think that could make a difference, that could have an impact? So we're actually looking at a couple different things. Um, one, we think that, that the government, both at all levels, has a huge role to play in holding companies accountable. 
Um, so regular data collection, reporting, and transparency, um, regulation and oversight of things like um, antitrust and competition, the utilization of um, algorithms, especially in the case of algorithmic bias, um, facial recognition software is something getting a lot of attention, um, and data protection and data privacy. Um, so accountability is a huge portion. Um, and the second piece, uh, we think that public policy can play a role in being proactive in developing more equitable futures. So uh, broadband infrastructure investment um, to provide high-speed high internet to um, folks who have been um, left behind um, and education and workforce development, um, providing resources to institutions to think about things like upskilling, reskilling, um, how to ensure that um, the existing black workforce can be prepared for tech jobs of the future. Um, and then also economic stimulation as we were talking about how to get more capital flowing into communities of color, how to inspire more black entrepreneurs and provide them the capital that they need. Um, there's a lot of legislation that can happen there. Well, do you think that these companies should be treated as utilities? I mean, they're ubiquitous and don't, shouldn't they be regulated uh, since they impact so many facets of our lives? I think that's a, a really outstanding question. I know that there is some legislation. There are a lot of folks um, considering different angles on that, on that piece, and we're following that very closely. Uh, but we do think that there is um, a role to play around regulation, um, around Section 230 and content moderation. Um, now that these companies have become so powerful as sources of information, um, and we saw what happened with the January 6th insurrection and, and the role of disinformation, misinformation, there is a role that the government should be playing, um, and, and we are, are following that very closely. Your leadership, the CAPOR Foundation, the leadership that you're providing in this space, which is exemplary. What of those big techs? I mean, they have foundations also. There's money that they could provide matching dollars for, let's say, venture capital in, in, in terms of what you're doing. Are you seeing that happening? Yeah, I think we've seen... Um, I would say over the past four years, we've seen more momentum, so more chief diversity officers hired, more commitments to diversity. There's a lot more work to be done inside of those workplaces to ensure um, inclusion and, and actually that the numbers move. As I mentioned, we only saw a one percentage point increase over the past four years. Um, but there is also a role that they can play in terms of deploying resources, their CSR budgets, um, the very, very powerful lobbies that they have as we think about um, things like broadband, STEM education, um, they can leverage their power um, in ways I think that can benefit all of society. Um, and the, the, the bad word that people don't like to talk about too much is taxes. And are these companies paying their fair share um, as they continue to make uh, tremendous amounts of profits? Are they paying their fair share to ensure that, that this is a, the type of equitable society that we all want to live in? Well, you deploy a lot of strategies, a lot of initiatives, and you know for the purpose of increasing participation in this space. What of the strategies, uh, what of the initiatives have proven most effective and you know, possibly uh, could be followed by others? I would say two, um, obviously as a researcher, I'm biased and I'll say, I think producing consistent research and continuing to call out the problem and, and just shine a spotlight on where the disparities exist. I think that has proven to be um, effective. Um, in, in a, just really getting people to understand and address the challenges. Um, and then second, on our venture capital side, we invest um, seed stage dollars in uh, gap closing startups that are led by entrepreneurs of color and diverse entrepreneurs. We have about 130 companies in the portfolio now who are doing amazing work. And I think once we see the ways that those entrepreneurs are contributing in really meaningful ways in spaces like health tech and uh, clean tech. Um, I think it just provides additional motivation for us to expand uh, the work and um, continue to do amazing things. Well, what you're doing is very important. And I hope when you have subsequent reports, you'll report on what these other companies are doing as well as companies, as foundations. You know, as Cuba Gooding said, uh, show me the money. Now, are they putting their money where their mouth is and making a difference in this uh, mammoth industry, mammoth space. But uh, thank you so very much for all you're doing. Thank you for what the Caper Foundation is doing. And above all, thank you for being here on State of Play. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure.
Welcome back to State of Play. Our topic today, the technology gap, especially for communities of color. Uh, we are very fortunate indeed to have with us now Dr. Devda Shetty. He is the Dean of Engineering and Applied Sciences at the University of the District of Columbia, the State University for the District of Columbia, and also an HBCU. Thank you so very much, Dean Shetty. Thank you, Mayor. So I said there was a problem, a problem of people of color being involved in technology. To what extent is it a real problem? It is a real problem because the, there are very few in numbers, very few people of color are in the area of technology. You know, and it had been there and we are trying to address it. At the uh, University of District of Columbia, I mean, we have this number of uh, federal grants. You know, our faculty apply for these research grants as well as educational grants. One part of those grants is like the outreach service. So the people, it will give an opportunity for our faculty to work with the high schools or organizations so that we can bring students to the campus, expose them to STEM and other type of activities, get them excited about computer science, get them excited about engineering. There are a lot of such activities are going on actually. So I can give you some examples also. We have we have training program. There is a program called ambassador program where we have our own students, the engineering students and computer science students reach out to the community, go to the schools and bring them and have a lot of fun type of activities. And as a result, we increase their interest in this area, STEM area. University of District of Columbia is one of which you, I think you told me at one point, 15 HBCUs in the United States that offers engineering and applied sciences. Is that the, the, the sum total of the ones out here? Yes, there are only 15 HBCUs which are ABET accredited. These are the accredited program, the top standard of accreditation. So out of 370 engineering schools, which is only 4%, and these 4% of engineering schools produce 29% of engineers and computer yeah. scientists. So that is a really a figure which should be looked at. So if the resources to these HBCUs is increased, you know, so it will result in more students, help more students. We'll be able to graduate more number of computer scientists and engineers, you know. So that is a clear cut advantage there. And do you think the federal government appreciates the challenge? You said the National Science Foundation has provided, for example, grants to the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, has the federal government weighed in so that you can expand the kind of programs you have reaching out to young people in secondary school? Yes, definitely. Federal government is very much interested. National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, NIST, National Institute of Standard and Technology, NASA, so, and there are several other organizations which are funding us, all mostly federal government, but each of those grants has a student component. So these grants go to the students, either as undergraduate scholarship, either as an opportunity for them to do research or reach out to high schools or reach out to community colleges so that we can bring the students and get them excited about STEM, engineering, and computer science. It's very encouraging all that you're doing, Dean Shetty, uh, and your insights and contributions are much appreciated. And thank you so very much for being on State of Play.